Hey, my name is Timothy Atik. I'm one of the pastors here. If this is your first time ever with us, I just want to say welcome. We're doing things a little bit different this morning. We're going to reserve some time of singing until after the message because uh, we are in a series on the Holy Spirit. And it just, my sense is that uh, one of the best things we can do this morning is to create a little bit more space for the Spirit of God to work in our lives and to speak to our hearts, to prepare us to then respond in Worship, So you can be ready for that in just a bit. Uh, last week, John Elmore started by talking about the AT&T outage, and I appreciated it so much. I don't want to move past that. I still want to revisit that horrific morning in all of our lives. But I just want to tell you my experience with it. Uh, the Wednesday night before that Thursday morning was the night of prayer and worship. That was the culmination of our 21 days of prayer and fasting. And so I went to bed on that Wednesday night on a high. And then I woke up that Thursday morning early because I was going to get in the car with my 12-year-old and head out to Sky Ranch for his overnight school trip, which meant I was going to be a chaperone sleeping in a cabin with another chaperone and 15 sixth grade boys. So when I woke up and my phone said SOS, I was like, I've never felt more seen or understood by my phone <laughs> than in this moment. Yes, Lord, save, save my soul. Right now, I beg you. But it was amazing how my phone changed everything that morning. Like everything just fell apart. Like I needed directions to the camp, so I had to start the map before I left my house. And then we got on 635 onto the access road and there was a wreck and 635 was completely shut down. And we were able to get off the access road and I just went and I parked. And I'm like, I literally cannot even look up an alternate route. Like I don't know what, I don't know what to do in this moment. So we ended up going home. We went home just so we could get connection again to look up an alternate route. And then when we got back into the car, I swung by the AT&T store because at this point, I'm still not sure if this is just, if this is just the world turning against Timothy Atik <laughs> or if this is more collective. And I walk into the AT&T store and the woman is walking towards me and I can see on her face, she knows exactly why I'm there and she knows she cannot do a thing for me. And that just told me that this wasn't just about me, it was about us. That the world, at least our worlds, were in some way shutting down. We got in the car, the only way I could communicate with my wife was my 12-year-old's gab watch. It was like, I'm here, if you need me, call me, this little piece of plastic. And, uh, and we, we begin to make our way out of town again. And once we start getting out of town, uh, connection is restored. And it, it honestly, it changed everything. Like just feeling that connection again. Like I felt relief. I felt resourced. I felt like I had everything I needed. I called my wife just because I could. She answered the phone more excited than she normally is when I called because she could see my name on the caller ID. Like everything, everything changed. And the reason I tell you that is because we are continuing in this series that we're in, this Spirit-led church. We're talking about the Holy Spirit, God's presence with us. And what's interesting, if you look in the scriptures, what you see is you see this strong connection with this idea of power in the Holy Spirit. When you think about the Holy Spirit, you should think of the idea of power. Listen to what Acts chapter 1 verse 8 says. It says, but you will receive power. When? When the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Power is associated with the Holy Spirit. When AT&T, when that outage occurred, I felt it on a personal level, but I also felt it on a collective level. It didn't just impact me, it impacted us. I needed AT&T to restore power, not just for me, but for us. 
And so the reason that I'm talking about this AT&T outage is because if, if power is associated with the Holy Spirit, I just want to ask the question, is it possible that there is a spiritual power outage in your life individually, or is it possible that there is a spiritual power outage in our lives collectively in our church? And if there was, would we even know it? If the Spirit wasn't moving in your life or at this church, would we, would we know it? Would we feel it? Would we experience it? The reason I, I'm even bringing this up is, is that I believe that some of us subscribe to a version of Christianity that is high on discipline and low on power. And I believe that it's possible. I mean, look around. Look at how many people are in this room right now. There's enough people that are just in the routine of getting up and pointing their car toward Watermark Community Church solely because it's routine that we could look around and be like, well, the auditorium was for the most part fairly full for two morning services. So yeah, everything's going great. But the fact that people are here, it only speaks to attendance. It does not speak to the Spirit's movement. So it's possible that we could all be here just because this is what we do on Sunday mornings, not because the Spirit of God is working in our lives. And so I just want to bring this up. Do you know what revival is? Revival is when power gets restored. Revival is what happens when there is a power outage and then spiritual power is restored. There's a power surge in our lives individually and in our church collectively. And so what I want to do today is I just want to spend some time assessing whether there is a spiritual power outage in our lives individually and in our church collectively. To put it plainly, what I'm talking about is, is the Spirit having His way in our lives and in our church? And the ultimate goal is for us to long for even, for an even greater work of the Spirit in our midst. The way that I want to assess how we're doing is I just want to invite us to ask and answer four questions. I'll go ahead and give you these questions. These questions are meant to be asked on an individual level for you, but also to be asked collectively of of our church. So here's the first question. Are we being led by the Spirit? The second question is, are we being filled by the Spirit? Number three, are we being emboldened? By the Spirit. And number four, are we unified in the Spirit? First question I want to answer today is Are we being led by the Spirit? But let me just say this before we talk about being led by the Spirit, it makes no sense to ask yourself the question, Am I led by the Spirit? if you don't yet have the Spirit. When we talk about the Holy Spirit, we are talking about God Himself living inside of you. The way that that comes about, I don't ever want to assume that everyone's on the same page. I don't want to ever assume that every person in the room is here because they know Jesus Christ. When we talk about having the Holy Spirit, the way that you have the Holy Spirit is that you have come to a place in your life where you have realized the person of Jesus Christ, that God himself left heaven and came to earth in the person of Jesus Christ. He took on flesh. He lived the life that we couldn't, a perfect life. He died the death that we all deserve to die because of our rebellion, our sin against God. And Jesus Christ died for our sins and rose from the dead, conquering Satan's sin and death so that you and I could be made right with God. And the way that we have a real and enjoyable and right relationship with God is because of what the Son of God, Jesus Christ, has done for us through his death, burial, and resurrection. And when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, God puts his spirit in you. And that's amazing news. I don't know if you live with that understanding as a Christian, but the God of the universe lives inside of you by the power and the presence of his spirit, which is a gift. And now our lives can bear fruit that looks like Jesus because of God's new covenant blessings in his spirit. So that's what we're talking about. If you're here this morning just as a visitor and you're 
sitting and listening to us talk about the Spirit, your first step might be to get the Spirit. And it comes through faith in Jesus Christ. The first question that we're answering is this. Are we being, are we being led by the Spirit? Are we being led by the Spirit? I love this story that we hear about Paul when he's on his second missionary journey in the book of Acts. Listen to what it says in Acts 16, verses 6 through 10. We're going to be all over the scriptures this morning. It says, and they went through the region of Phrygia in Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And when they had come up to Mysia, they attempted to go to Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there, urging him, saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go on into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. I hope you paid attention to what's happening in that story, but there's two things that I find really interesting. One is that in this passage, it is unique to this passage that the Holy Spirit is referred to as the Spirit of Jesus, which is just a reminder that it is Jesus Christ that is intricately guiding the work of the gospel in the lives of believers and through believers, and he's doing it by the presence of the Holy Spirit at work in them. The second thing that I find interesting is that the Holy Spirit told them no to something good. Did you see that? The Holy Spirit actually told Paul no when it came to speaking the word in Asia and Bithynia. Why? Because the Spirit is leading and directing, and Paul has a sensitivity to follow. So here's my question. When we're assessing if there's a spiritual power outage in our lives individually or in our church collectively, would you know it if the Holy Spirit told you no to something? Would you know it? Would you be able to sense it or hear it or respond to it? There's times where, uh, where the Atiks will get in our sweet black minivan and go on a road trip. And so there's times where all three of my boys will be in the back on screens with headphones on and I'll just start talking and I will be getting no response and I'll just look back and they are all preoccupied. Like they can't hear my voice in their lives. Like we could be driving through some of the prettiest parts of the country and I could be saying, hey guys, look out, but they can't hear the direction that I'm giving them. I could be asking them to do something and they can't respond. Some of you parents are like, that's every day for me. (laughs) But I just wonder if that's us with the spirit, if the spirit is talking and leading and guiding and we have these spiritual uh, earplugs in. That if he told us no to something, we wouldn't even know it. If he told us go to something, we wouldn't even know it. Like the Elmores were sharing last week about how the Spirit was leading them. And some of y'all might have heard him sharing and that just felt so foreign to you. That something and you heard that and you just wondered, if God moved in our lives that way, would we even Would we even know it or be able to sense it? So let me just encourage you, one of the best things you can do is start asking this question. Holy Spirit, what are you wanting me to know right now? Imagine asking that question all throughout the day. Imagine asking that question when you're reading your Bible. Ask it when you're in a hard meeting. Ask it when you're in a fight with your spouse or your roommate. Ask it when you're driving in your car. Holy Spirit, what are you wanting me to know right now? Because we want to be a people who are led by the Holy Spirit. We want to be a church that is led by the Holy Spirit. We want to be led and directed by the Spirit to accomplish all of Christ's purposes for Watermark Community Church. So here's what this means. As elders, 
We draw a distinction between what we can do and what we are called to do. Those are two different things. There's a lot that we can do. There's a lot of high capacity strategic thinkers in this church that we could get enough of you into a conference room and we could fill a whiteboard with hundreds, if not thousands of different ways that we can reach Dallas and the world. But one day we as elders, we will stand before God and we will give an account, not for what we can do or could do, but what we were called by God to do. And because there's a difference between what we can do and what we're called to do, we as elders, we want to value sensitivity before strategy. We want to value sensitivity to the leading of the Spirit before we just snap into strategic thinking about what we can do. And so that's why we as elders, when we get together every Thursday morning to meet, we don't open up the agenda. We don't talk business until we have spent the first 45 minutes together just seeking God together, praying together, asking God to lead us together. And I would just invite you to pray, pray for us, pray for, pray for your elders. We want your prayers. Would you ask God to lead us and to give us a deep sensitivity to his leading that we would always lead out of sensitivity and not just strategy? For months, we as elders, we sought the Lord and we sensed the Lord by the leading of the Holy Spirit to clarify who we will be as a church moving forward. And so if you were with us on January 7th, we just unpacked, hey, these are 10 things that are going to mark our church moving forward. If you weren't here on January 7th, please go back and listen to that message. But when we rolled out for you these 10 things that are to mark our church, that was our way of saying, hey, we have sought the Lord and we sense that the Holy Spirit is calling us to do this and not this. This is our way of saying the Holy Spirit has told us, be about this, don't be about that. And so to just remind you of who we said we want to be, we said 10 things. We said we want to be a gospel-saturated church, a praying church, a Bible-revering church, a spirit-led church, a missional church, a sending church, a maturing church, a shepherding church church, a community church, and a unifying church. Now, I know some CEOs in the room are like, you know what, if you've got 10, you've got none. And so let me just boil it down for you. When we talk about being a gospel-saturated, praying, Bible-revering, spirit-led church, you know what we're basically saying? All we're saying is we want to be a church that abides in Jesus. That's what we're talking about. When you put those four things together, what we are saying is we want to be a people who know what it is to be with Jesus, to live life with Jesus, to be empowered by Jesus, to enjoy intimate connection with Jesus. We want to be a people first and foremost that abide in Jesus. And when we talk about being a missional and sending and maturing church, all we're saying is we want to be a church that makes disciples. If we're not making disciples, I don't know what we're doing. God hasn't called us to just gather people. He has called us to make disciples of all nations. And when we talk about being a shepherding and community and unifying church, we're just talking about being a church that enjoys life together. So if you want to know what we're about, we want to be a people who abide in Jesus, make disciples, and enjoy life together. That's what we're about. That's what we are relentlessly pursuing. This is how the Spirit is leading, leading us. And so I just invite you into that. This is what we're about. Is that what you want to be about with us? Do you want to be about abiding in Jesus, making disciples, and enjoying life together? I know that there's been different changes over the past two months. And change can be difficult. But I want you to know, we as elders, like a day will come where we will stand before God and we will give an account for how we stewarded what he entrusted to us. The question from God to us is not going to be, hey, you know what, do you think that everyone was pretty satisfied with their Sunday experience? Do you think that everyone's kids like went willingly to church so... So adults could kind of have some me time in the service? No. 
And yet that's a lot of people's criteria for church. When they come, you know what? Was I satisfied with my experience today? Did Watermark do enough to make me feel good about myself and make it comfortable and pleasing for my family? I want you to know that we have been called by God to steward really significant things. Look at the facility that he's given us at one of the busiest intersections in our city. We have about 2,000 children on our campus this morning. Like the next generation. On Tuesday night, we will have over 2,000 young adults in this room. There are millions of people in our city who still don't know Jesus. There are billions of people in our world who still have never even heard the name of Jesus. And so we don't have the luxury of just coasting into eternity. Like we don't have the luxury of making our highest priorities comfort and predictability. Like we want to sprint to the finish line whenever that is coming. Like we want to hit the tape being all about exalting Christ and proclaiming the gospel here in Dallas, Texas. So that's what we're about. And we want to be led by the Spirit. When the Spirit says no, we want to stop. And when he says go, we want to move. So the first question that we need to answer individually and then collectively is, are we led by the Spirit? The second question that we want to ask and answer is this, are we being filled by the Spirit? Are we being filled by the Spirit? Listen to what Ephesians chapter 5 verse 18 says. It says this, and do not get drunk with wine... For, this is, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. And so what Paul is doing is he's, he's drawing a contrast between um, getting, uh, being influenced by alcohol or being influenced by the Spirit. Both alcohol and the Spirit are meant to completely control you. So when someone is intoxicated with alcohol, it affects every part of you. You become out of control. It changes the way you speak. It changes the way that you act. And your life is wasted, literally. Like it's a waste. Your words can be careless. You can hurt others. You can hurt yourself. And yet Paul is drawing a contrast between being intoxicated with wine and being intoxicated with the Spirit. And what's interesting is that when you are intoxicated with the Spirit, you aren't out of control. You're actually completely controlled by God so that your words count, they matter, they're honoring to the Lord, they're a blessing to others. Your actions are actually glorifying to God and helpful to others. Paul commands us to be filled. It's a command and it's in It's in the present tense, which means that it's supposed to be ongoing or continuous, and yet it's in the passive voice, which means that you can't be filled with the Spirit on your own. Like, that's not something you can do. It is something that has to be done to you. And so when we talk about being filled with the Spirit, I want to be clear. So if you're tuned out, tune back in just real quick. When we talk about being filled with the Spirit, we're not talking about activity nearly as much as we are talking about availability. What we are talking about is a daily encounter with the Spirit of God where you make yourself fully available, fully surrendered to the Spirit of God to do His work in you. I love how scholar Harold Honer explains it. He says, with the indwelling, John talked about that last week, that when you know Jesus Christ, The Spirit of God lives in you. You are indwelt by the Spirit. With the indwelling, each Christian has all of the Spirit. But the command to be filled with the Spirit enables the Spirit to have all of the believer. You see the difference? You already have all the Spirit. The question is, does the Spirit have all of you? When you're filled with the Spirit, when you make yourself available to the Spirit on a daily basis, that's what happens, is the Spirit begins to take control in your life reflects 
Jesus in a beautiful way. So let's just get really practical real quick. What does it practically look like to be filled with the Spirit? Well, I would draw the distinction that it's the difference between responding to God in reacting to people in circumstances. Like if you want to experience what it is like to be filled with the Spirit, it is the difference between responding to God or reacting to people in situations and circumstances. I just want you to imagine. Imagine waking up tomorrow and nothing is going right. There's another cell phone outage and you feel the pressure of everything you have to do. And imagine just asking this question first thing in the morning. Holy Spirit, how do you want me to respond right now? Imagine how different your day will be if you ask that question, Holy Spirit, how do you want me to respond right now? Imagine being in a conversation with your spouse or your roommate or a kid or your boss or a customer where you feel attacked or misunderstood or misrepresented. And imagine asking the question in that moment before you react, imagine just asking, Holy Spirit, how do you want me to respond right now? It will change everything. There have been times this week where the Holy Spirit has been like a shock collar in my life. And it's been so encouraging because there's been moments where I've wanted to respond in frustration or be short with my kids. And it's like I'm about to, I'm about to react. And it's like the Spirit of God just grabs hold of me and is like, take a breath. And so literally last night even, with one of my kids, I was just like. (sighs) And it changed everything. It is so encouraging when the Holy Spirit just grabs hold of you and controls you and says, don't say that. That feels right in the moment. That would be a major reaction and that's going to cause you a lot of unnecessary pain. So let's just push pause on that right now. Here's a better idea. And then at the same time this week, so I would say that there's been several power surges this week, which has been amazing, and yet there's still been some power outages for Timothy Atigue. I've, I've still been discouraged this week at, at different times where I've experienced fear or anxiety or a fear of man or a need for people's approval. And in that moment, do you know what's happening? I'm reacting. I'm reacting to people. I'm reacting to circumstances instead of responding to God. That's a power outage. When the God of the universe lives inside of me by the presence of his spirit. So we should ask the question, Holy Spirit, how do you want me to respond right now? That's what it looks like to be filled with the spirit on an individual level. What does it look like for us as a church? Like even right now in this moment or in a few, in a little bit when we sing again. What does it look like for Watermark Community Church to be filled with the Spirit. Well, listen to what Paul goes on to say in Ephesians 5.18. He says, do not get drunk with wine, for that's debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Watch this, verse 19, addressing one another in psalms, in hymns, in spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Did you see what that just said? It says, when you're filled with the Spirit, you know what you do? You make melody to the Lord in your heart, with your heart. The heart is the control center of your being. It involves your emotions, your desires, your convictions, your will. It involves your being. And so what Paul is saying is, when you are filled with the Spirit, do you know what we're talking about? We are talking about you being fully awake to what the Spirit is doing in your life. And and the Spirit's goal is to glorify Christ in you. And so with all of your being, you're You're aware of what God is doing. Your eyes are being opened to the beautiful realities of Jesus Christ. So when you come into this place, you're you're in step with him. You are clicked in with what God is doing and what he's showing to you. And you are becoming more and more captivated by God's goodness. You are impressed by God. You want more of God. You step into this place and when you step in, you're aware God is here and I'm about to, I'm about to meet with him and, and God is showing you things and the result is that your heart overflows 
in worship with melodies from your mouth. My fear is that many of us come in here on Sundays and we make melody to the Lord with our mouths, but our hearts are absent. Jesus actually spoke of that as hypocrisy. Listen to what he said to the Pharisees in Matthew 15, 8 through 9. He says, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me. Isn't that interesting? Did that just describe anyone here? What was, in, what was happening in you during the two and a half songs we sang at the beginning of the service? Was it your being welling up with joy that overflowed in melodies from your mouth? Or were you singing every word while spectating, critiquing, or problem solving? Maybe you were critiquing, like, why, is, why are we singing that song again? We've sang that song too much. I don't, I don't like this song. Why is he wearing that on stage? Like, I don't get that. That doesn't make sense to me. That's, that's critiquing. Or maybe you were problem solving, like you've got something coming up today or this week, and so you're just mouthing every word, but you are, you're, you're checking stuff off in your to-do list, or you're working some equation trying to figure out life. I call that autopilot worship, where the mouth is moving, but the heart is absent. That's why we only sing two, two and a half songs at the beginning, because we're going to sing more on the back end. And when we do, one of the best things we can just do is ask the Spirit, Holy Spirit, how do you want me to respond right now? How do you want me to respond right now in singing? And some of y'all, when we say amen, I'm going to go ahead and call it out right now. You're going to be like, he said amen. It is time for me to leave. Let's get a jump on this traffic. Let's get to Costco. We can make it to the restaurant without having to wait. Let's go. And I just say, you can Now, you're going to think twice before you do it, but let me just, (laughs) let me, at least for this Sunday, next Sunday, enough time will have passed. You can just go for it. But but don't short circuit what the Spirit of God wants to do in your life. You can't, you went to all the effort to get here. Meet with God. Don't miss this chance. Don't miss the opportunity. And then let me just say this, respond freely. Like I grew up, I was born in 81, but like my experience with the church was, was really like formative in the 90s. And I grew up going to an amazing Bible church. I mean, like I, I, I know the Lord today in large part because of what the Spirit did through this amazing church. But it was a time when there was a lot of fear of the charismatic movement in, in how that was progressing. And so to be in worship and to close your eyes, like you were taking a walk on the wild side. <laughs> I was like, oh man, he's got his eyes closed. We lost him. Like, this isn't going to go well. We're going to have to reel him back in. And like, if you raised your hands, you jumped off the cliff. It's like, I don't know, I don't know how she thought she could come in here and do that, but we're going to talk to her afterward. You don't do that here. Like, I still remember the first time ever that I raised my hands in worship. I was at a passion conference, and, and I was like, I, I sensed that I was going to, but I was like, man, if I do that, if I cross that line, I can never go back. Like, that's not something that you can take back. Like, you're, when you put your hands up, that's making a declaration to the world that I'm becoming somebody different. And I, I just was like, I'm going to do it. I, I'm going to, and I was like, You know, you kind of start at the hinge. You know, you kind of got this motion, and it's like, yeah. And I just, I was like, yeah, yeah, I can do this. I can raise my hands. Yeah. And uh, some of y'all know exactly what I'm talking about. Some of y'all are still just here. Maybe you do the one arm. Sometimes you do this. Some of you go for this. I'm kind of more of like a fist pumper lately. If you watch me, I'm just like, but... (laughs) I mean, you do you. <laughs> but when you look at the scriptures, like clapping or singing loudly or raising your hands or sitting silently, all of them are biblical motions. And yet, 
Some of us are fearful of truly, fully responding. Let me just say this. Um, My fear is not getting carried away by the Spirit. My fear is completely disregarding and ignoring the Spirit. What do I mean by that? I'm not afraid of it. I I don't think we're going to get carried away by the Spirit. I, I think that elders, our theology is intact. Like, like, but what we want for people is biblical freedom that you would respond in worship as the Spirit leads you to respond. Please don't spectate. The people up here, they are worshiping as they lead. They are not performers. They are worship leaders. They are seeking to lead you to worship alongside them. So engage. Thank you. One person. Thank you for interacting. Goodness. And then let me just say this. I love how Paul said, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. What does that mean? Does that mean that there's going to become like a, like a musical around here where it's like, how is your day going? <laughs> no. What's interesting is to think, look, when you come into this place and you start singing, it's not just you and God. When you worship, you're not just declaring something to God. You're actually declaring something to the people around you. When you start worshiping, what you're saying is, hey, in case you're asleep, God is worth it. Like if you're distracted right now, wake up. Let's do this together. I love what David says in Psalm 34. He's like, come exalt the Lord with me. Come on, let's do this. Let's go. Don't spectate worship. All right, I've got to move on. <laughs> so are we filled by the Spirit? Number three. This one will go quick. Are we being emboldened by the Spirit? Are we being emboldened by the Spirit? Acts 4.31. Listen to what it says. It says, when they had prayed, this is right after Peter and John were busted out of prison. It says, when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and did what? They continued to speak the word of God with boldness. And so this is just good to to analyze. Is there a spiritual power outage in your lives? There are times, I'll just confess, there are times where I fail to turn a conversation spiritual or to share the gospel just out of fear, fear of man, Fear of making things awkward. Fear of hurting the relationship. And as I was preparing this week, it was just so good for me to be reminded that that fear is not from the Lord at all. I've got the spirit of the living God in me. And he empowers me to share the gospel. So even this week, I was going to get my hair cut and I go to the same girl every time. Like that, that's how it works. Like I, I don't want to risk it. Like I, she, she knows what I need. And there's been times when I've gone to see her where we've, we've, we've talked around spiritual things. I've asked if I could pray for her, but I've never shared the gospel with her. And as I was preparing for this message, I was just like, I think God wants me to just share it with her. And so it's so good for me to know like, hey, I, I have the spirit of God living in me. So when I sat in that chair, I was just like, hey, uh, this is random, but I just feel like I'm supposed to ask you if I can share with you how Jesus changed my life. That's it. Like, it was like, I'm not looking for, for like a progressive in. It's like, you know what? Let me just cut to it. I mean, I've got you for another 20 minutes here and you can't go anywhere. So, although you have a lot of power right now, but... Uh, And it was the power of the Holy Spirit in me. And it was so good to just push back on any fear of awkwardness and to be able to tell her, look, hey, I grew up a rule follower and I believe that that 
I could earn God's love with good behavior. But what I realized is that God's love isn't something that you earn as a reward. It's something you can only receive freely as a gift because honestly, you can never be good enough for God. That's why Jesus is so important because Jesus Christ lived the perfect life that I never could. And he died for my sins and he rose from the dead so that I can experience complete forgiveness with God. So many people want to believe that, that God is kind of a do good, get good, do bad get bad type of God and that's just not him. And so if you've never understood the gospel, that's it. That Jesus has come to do what you can't. And so I just, I encourage you. Like I, I know what it is like to experience fear when it comes to sharing your faith. And there's no shame here with that. But I do want to encourage you to push back on that fear. And just say the spirit of the living God lives inside of me to empower me. The fourth question and final question is this, are we unified in the spirit? Are we unified in the spirit? We talked a couple weeks ago about the spirit's work of adoption, that because of the spirit of God, we belong in the family of God. We are children of God because of the Spirit's work of adoption in our lives, which means that you're a son or a daughter of God because of the work of the Spirit. It means that you have brothers and sisters in the faith because of the work of the Holy Spirit. So every time we get together, every Sunday when we gather, this is a family reunion. So we just have to evaluate, do we want to be a healthy or a dysfunctional family? Like, what are we going to be? Are we going to be a healthy or a dysfunctional family? family. Listen to Acts 4, verse 32, which comes right after the verse I just read about the Spirit emboldening the apostles. It goes on and says this in verse 32. It says, now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. Do you see this? It says the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. They were unified. And you might read that and be like, well, the full number, what are we talking about? Are we talking about like 20 people in someone's home? And yeah, that's a lot more doable than 10,000 people. No, Acts 4, verse 4 told us that at this point, 5,000 men had trusted Christ. So if you add on wives and children, we're talking about a church in the first century, approximately the same size as Watermark Community Church, and it says that they were of one heart and soul. They were, they were unified. There was, there was no division. No one was dying on the hill of their preferences or opinions. No one was looking at the church saying, you know what, are you, are you meeting all of my needs? Are you, are you doing things exactly how I think you should do them? No, there was a dying to self. There was a, a common desire for Christ to be exalted and for the gospel to go forth. And so I just want to share my heart with you just real quick. I, I think it's good for us to acknowledge that we are doing things that the enemy hates. We are doing things that the enemy hates. Like we just finished up 21 days of praying and fasting as a church, that Wednesday night, the 21st, we gathered together and we shared stories testifying to God's freedom in people's lives. We are doing things that the enemy hates. There's fruit. The Spirit of God is moving. And at the same time, there's, there's change right now. We rolled out new vision. We're, we're losing the Elmores, people that we, we love on staff. And it's a recipe when you put everything together, the fact that God is doing good things alongside of different change that is happening. It's a recipe for attack. It's, it's a recipe for division. And so we have to remember what Peter tells us in 1 Peter 5a, be sober minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. And so I just want to call it out right now. We have an enemy who would love to cause division in our church and he would love to use you to cause it. So let me just encourage you with Paul's words to the, to the 
believers in Ephesus, he says this in Ephesians 4, I therefore a prisoner for the Lord. I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. Did you see that? Eager, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. What does it look like to be eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace right now at Watermark? Let me just encourage you to do a few things. And then we'll respond in worship. One, seek clarity. If there's anything happening that's confusing to you, seek clarity. I stand down front every Sunday until everyone is gone. I'll be happy to talk to you today. If I can provide clarity, I'd love to do it. Number two, be a dead end for gossip, criticism, or negative talk. Like if people start talking negatively, call it out and just say, look, There's a right way and there's a wrong way to express concern. And this type of negative criticism, this is not of God. It will divide instead of unify. Number three, respond instead of react. Respond to God instead of reacting to people and the circumstances. I'm just going to be honest with you. Like I get emails from people I have never met who don't even start with a greeting. There's no hello TA, we've never met, this is who I am. It's literally just the body of an email with their critique or their hot take. You can't even dignify me to just say, hello TA, this is going to be a tough email. What that is, is keyboard courage. It's feeling the freedom to say whatever you want because your computer screen or phone depersonalizes it. And I don't, I, I can take the tough emails. It's hard though for me to believe that someone woke up, spent time with God, met with Jesus, made themselves completely available to the Spirit of God to lead and direct their steps, ask the Spirit what he should He would have them say and then fire off an email that doesn't even acknowledge the person. And this is just good. This isn't just about me. This is about how we communicate with each other in our community groups. This is how we communicate out in the world with parents of our kids at different schools. We're either going to unify or we are going to divide. So when it comes to how you communicate, when it comes to how you text or how you email, here's a good rule to live by. Before you hit send, read it back and just answer the question. If you had to read that message to that person eye to eye, like if you had to stand in front of them and read it, would you still say the same thing? Or would you feel a need to caveat or... Or say, well, what I really meant here was, or I just want to make sure you hear my tone that this is what I mean. Because we're either going to divide or we're going to unify. Respond instead of react. And then finally, be all in. Be all in with what God is doing here. Like come ready and expectant to worship on Sundays. Double down on your commitment to your community group. Pray regularly for what God is doing here. Start praying by name for one unbeliever every day until Easter. If you're part of the 35% of members who haven't given a dollar to Watermark in the past year, jump in. If you aren't serving, jump in. We need more people to serve. We turned away 76 kids from our children's ministries last Sunday simply because we didn't have enough people to serve to accommodate them. We have women waiting to get in groups in region. We need more female leaders. Since the beginning of 2024, Watermark Health has turned away about 300 patients at our skimming clinic because we don't have enough volunteers. So my point is just be all in. Jump in with what God is, what God is doing here. How do we respond to a message like this? When we talk about being led by the Spirit and being filled by the Spirit, being emboldened by the Spirit, being unified in the Spirit, here's what I want to do. I just want to call us to be a people who pray and then respond in worship. So this is just a moment where I'm going to ask you to get in a posture where you want to seek God and beg God through prayer. So if you want to get on your knees, you can get on your knees. If you want to stand, you can stand. If you just want to sit where you're sitting, you can do that as well. But I'm going to ask 
that we pray that there would be a power surge in our lives individually and a power surge in this church collectively. And so let's just take a moment and let's pray. And let's ask for God's movement in this place. And so I just want to invite you right now to just say, God, I want to be led by you. Would you give me a sensitivity to your spirit? I want to know. I would want to know it if the spirit was telling me no or go. Just ask the question, Holy Spirit, is there anything that you want me to know right now? Just ask him. And then ask the Spirit to fill this place as we're about to to worship. Just ask the Spirit, Holy Spirit, how would you have me respond in worship right now? And then pray, just say, God, would you give me an opportunity to share the gospel this week and the boldness by the power of your spirit to do it. And then pray that God would unify our church, that that by the power of his spirit, we would be of one heart, one soul. Pray against the enemy's work of division in our midst. And then if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, you've heard the gospel, the good news of Jesus clearly today, then you can just pray, Lord Jesus, would you come into my life today? Thank you that you died on the cross for me. Thank you that you rose from the dead for me. Would you come into my life? Would you forgive me of my sins? Would you lead me in a new life? I want you to be my savior, and my Lord. Holy Spirit, would you have your way in our lives? Would you exalt Christ in us and through us? We need you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.